Hello, I hope you're doing fantastic. Have you heard of the Arduino Millis function? Did you know that it gives you access to the Arduino's internal timer counter hardware that can be used for the timing of different events? In this lesson, we're going to take a detailed look at what the Arduino Millis function is. Specifically, we're going to talk about a hardware clock, a timer counter module, how to actually get the value from the Millis function, some things to consider when storing the value of the Millis function, and also some things to consider when doing math on those values. And finally, we'll talk about the tensile strength of a rubber band. So what is the Millis function? To answer this question, we need to first learn what a hardware clock is and also what a timer counter is. So just hang with me for a moment as we talk briefly about hardware clocks and timer counters. So generally speaking, a hardware clock is an electrical circuit that generates a signal, like a voltage pulse, at a consistent frequency. Now there's a lot of different circuits that can generate voltage signals. Some are really precise, some you can make from like discrete components that you might hook up on a breadboard, and others are built into modules that we can connect to our Arduinos. Now the integrated circuit that an Arduino uses has a built-in hardware clock, which is pretty cool but most Arduino boards have an onboard crystal oscillator circuit. It's this oscillator circuit that is used as the clock source for the Arduino. Now keep in mind, a clock source isn't like a wristwatch saying, hey, it's 6 a.m., time to go get some coffee. A clock is simply generating a consistent signal. We'll call that signal a tick. So if we want to time events, a clock input only gets us so far. What we really want to be able to do is count the number of ticks and then at any point in time be able to read how much time has passed since that clock started counting. Lucky for us, the integrated circuit that the Arduino uses already has this piece of hardware built right into it. It's called a timer counter module. A timer counter module can do a bunch of stuff, but for the sake of this discussion about the Millis function, we're interested in a couple specific features. The first is its ability to count the clock ticks. And the second is to keep a running tally of those clock ticks. So a timer counter is able to count clock ticks. It starts counting as soon as power is applied to the Arduino and it doesn't stop. It's always counting and you don't even have to tell it to start in the sketch. It just goes and it starts counting at zero and it counts up and up and up until it gets to its maximum count and then it starts over and it begins counting again at zero. So how long can it count for? Hey, that's a good question. It can count up for 49 days until it starts over again. So some of the jargon for that timer counter starting over is called rolling over. That is the timer rolls over. But a more proper way to say it is that the timer overflows. Once I sat and waited for 49 days to see if I could see the timer roll over. For 49 days, I didn't eat or drink, except like coffee and donuts and crab cakes with really delicious seafood sauce. But anyway, so what does this timer and counter stuff have to do with the Arduino Millis function? So here's the deal. The Millis function gives us access to the running tally that the timer counter has been keeping track of. When we call the Millis function, it tells us the current value of the counter in milliseconds. So said another way, the value that is returned by Millis is the amount of time that has passed since the Arduino board was plugged in, you know, like since it had power applied to it. So what do I mean returned by? Okay, well, let's just do a quick review of some jargon around Arduino functions. There's two words I want to talk about, call and return. So when you type a function out, that is when you use it in your code in a sketch, you're said to be calling the function, or you could say it's a function call. So when I type out millis in my sketch, I am calling the millis function. Now, if a function performs a calculation for you and it gives you some information back, it's said to return a value. You might hear something like, what value does that function return? So when I say that the Millis function returns a value, what I'm saying is that it gives us the current time in milliseconds that the Arduino has been running. So how do you actually get that value? Well, to get the value 
you can call the millis function and then set the returned value equal to a variable. So here I've got a variable named previous time and I set it equal to the output of the millis function. So every time the Arduino goes through the loop, this variable is going to be updated with the most recent count of time in milliseconds. So after one minute of being powered up, the millis function would return the number 60,000. Since every second has 1,000 milliseconds and every minute has 60 seconds. So that'd be 1,000 times 60. If you waited seven days, the number returned by millis would be over 600 million. Another way to get the value of millis is to call the function inside of a condition. So for example, let's say we have an if statement. Now an if statement has a condition. And if the condition is true, then we execute the code in the if statement. But if the condition is false, then we skip that code. So we can directly use the millis function inside of a condition like this. So when that condition gets evaluated, the millis function checks in with the timer counter and then it returns the current count in milliseconds and it dynamically updates every time this condition is checked. So for me, it kind of helps me think of that millis call, that function call. I just kind of think about it as a number as opposed to being like a function. It helps me think through it. So those are two ways that you can get the counter timer value using the millis function. But getting those values doesn't actually mean that we know how to use them. So in another lesson, I'll discuss how we actually use the millis function in a way that helps you out a ton, especially when you start running into issues using the Arduino delay function, which can happen pretty darn quick. But before we call this lesson quits, I want to highlight one more thing about the millis function. You may have noticed that the value that the millis function returns can get really big really quick. The biggest value that it can return, it's like over 4 billion and some change. So practically what that means for us is that if we're going to store that number in a variable, we need to make sure that we use a data type for that variable that has space for it. So as a quick refresher, a variable, it's like a storage locker. It can only fit so much stuff. If you're trying to stick like dirty socks, an old typewriter, and 74 years worth of Vogue magazine into a tiny little gym locker, it's just not going to fit. The same goes with variables. If you use a variable that's too small and try to store a really big number in it, some funky stuff is going to happen. The data type of a variable is what specifies the kind of data and the size of the data that a variable will be storing. So with an Arduino Uno, you've got a bunch of data type options. We've got bytes, but those only hold a number from 0 to 255, so that's way too small. We've got integers, those will hold a value from negative 32,000 up to positive 32,000 and some change. But as we saw, that's still really too small. We could fill that up in a matter of seconds. Well, there's also floats, and those can hold a really big number. But generally, they're supposed to be used for numbers with decimal points, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to use those. But we do have a really big data type on an Arduino Uno that's called a long, and it's 32 bytes. And that's a number from negative 2 billion and some change to positive 2 billion and some change. So now we're talking. That seems pretty big. But we can make it even bigger. By default, a long data type will hold negative values. But since we know that the value that Millis returns is always going to be positive, then it seems like kind of a waste. Lucky for us, we can use an unsigned long. And what that allows us to do is to shift the storage capacity to the positive numbers. And so now it allows us to hold a value from zero all the way up to four billion and some change, which is perfect. Especially since if we read the documentation of the millis function, we'll see that that function returns an unsigned long. So the moral of the story, is when you are saving values from the millis function into a variable, that variable should be an unsigned long. Now a quick note about these unsigned longs that can really screw some stuff up when you're using millis, and I know personally from experience. If you're gonna be doing any math with a variable that is an unsigned variable, then make sure that these two things are true and you should be good. First, any other variables that are gonna be used to change 
that variable should also be an unsigned long. So let's say you've got a variable called previous time and you're gonna subtract a value from it and that value is in another variable. Say it's like current time. Well, make sure that that other variable is also an unsigned long. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is if you're gonna be using any raw numbers to do a calculation on an unsigned variable, make sure that at least one of the numbers in that calculation has a U and L formatter at the end of it. So for example, if you're dividing previous time, which is an unsigned variable, by 100, or maybe you're like dividing it by 1,000, then make sure that the number's written as 100 UL or 1,000 UL. So raw numbers like these, they're called integer constants. And if you don't put that UL formatter on the end, then the calculation can create some really unexpected results. And I won't get into the details about the strange results that can happen and necessarily why it happens, but basically it has to do with when those numbers roll over after they get to their maximum value. And that UL formatter at the end of that raw number specifies that that number should be treated as an unsigned long. So let's do a quick review of what we talked about. First, we said, hey, what's a hardware clock? And a hardware clock is an electrical circuit that generates a signal at a consistent frequency. Then we talked about a timer counter. And we said that the Arduino has a built-in timer counter. And the timer counter counts the number of ticks that the clock has made. And it keeps a running tally of those ticks. Then we talked about how the millis function can get that running tally for us. We talked about using a variable to store the value returned from millis, and we also talked about calling the millis function inside of a condition. Finally, we talked about using an unsigned long data type to store the value returned from millis. And we also talked about some of the precautions when doing math with an unsigned long variable data type. All right, well, hey, I hope you found this lesson useful. Check out the challenges at the end, and I hope you have a great week. Bye.